Hello and welcome back. So there's actually something I forgot uh, to mention last time, but there is actually one other way um, to calculate the cost of uh, common stock, or the cost of equity, um, and that is something that we call the CAPM model. So that's what we're going to deal with uh, this time. Uh, basically, there were there were two ways to cal there's there's two ways to calculate the cost of common stock. Um, you know, let's just write down again the cost of common stock. The first way to calculate was by doing d1 over p minus f um, plus g. That was the first way. And now the second way to calculate it is by using this CAPM model. Um, so we're just going to finish with that um, and then move on to, to putting it all together into the weighted average cost of capital. So what's the idea of the CAPM model? Well, the CAPM model is also very, very famous um, and also you've got to know it for, for interviews. So listen carefully. Um, let's just write down, um, let's just write it down first. So this is usually written as RE, which is uh, the return on equity. But it should also be viewed as the cost of equity because when we're from the corporate finance uh, standpoint, from the corporation standpoint, the, the return on equity that investors are expecting is the cost of equity to us because we have to pay that out to investors. So let's think about this as RE, the, the uh, return on equity. Um, but, you know, that, that I'm also just going to put over here KCS, the cost of common stock, um, you know, or, or the cost of, of equity in general. Um, this is just another way to calculate it. So RE, the return on equity, or the cost of equity, equals RF plus beta times RM minus RF. Now let's just name these variables before we before we explain exactly what this mumble jumble means. Now RF and this is the risk free rate. We'll get to it in a second, don't worry. Um, beta, we're just going to name the variables first. Um, it's just beta. Um, and I'm actually going to do just a very, very tiny little explanation there. Um, and that is what we would call the relative risk. We'll get to it. And then RM is the, uh, is the return on the overall return on the market. It's called the market return. And then this parentheses RM minus RF, um, you know, as you can see from the basic math, it's the difference between the return on the market and the risk free rate. Um, so we call that the market risk premium. And you're probably asking, what does all of this mean? So, let's scroll on for a sec. So, just so we're clear, this right here, this is the CAPM model. This is the CAPM. R equals RF plus beta times R M minus RF. And the variables over here are actually pretty simple to explain. The risk-free rate is basically the rate on a risk-free security. Um, so this could be, you know, usually in the exam, in questions, it will be referred to as the U.S. government treasury bond or a treasury bill, usually of similar to maturity to the holding period return um, of the security or, you know, of the raising capital horizon that we're discussing. Um, but that that's really more complicated. In the, in the question, you know, just look for the word government, uh, because government securities are backed by what's called the full faith and credit of the US government. And that means that if the government ever see that they're going to default on any US Treasury bill, note or bond, they'll just jack up taxes or do something artificial, print more money, um, just to pay back the coupon rates so they don't default. So they're called risk-free because they actually are risk-free. Um, so government, bond, um, or notes. Um, another word that he might use uh, is treasury, 
uh, because that's what they also commonly refer to as treasury bonds, treasury notes, or government bonds, government notes, same thing. Uh, so that's the risk-free rate. And so far, you should be able to get a type of idea that the risk of investing into an equity on the stock market, i.e. our public company that we're talking about, the risk to an investor, um, or the return rather, that the, the investor wants to, uh, wants to get from investing in this equity on the stock market, is at least the risk-free rate plus this whole thing over here, plus a little bit more. He needs to be compensated at least the risk-free rate. If he's not getting at least the risk-free rate, he may as well have not taken the risk of investing in the stock market and just invested in, invested in a risk-free security. So he needs to get at least the risk-free rate, plus also this good stuff over here. Now what's this good stuff? So let's start with beta. Beta we define as relative risk. Now the idea of beta is pretty simple. Um, a lot of investors use it, a lot of investors don't use it, basically because the whole idea of beta is based on historical returns, and history doesn't necessarily determine the future, and that's obviously a very basic premise of, of investing. Um, but the idea of beta is that it's a relative risk to the stock market. So, the beta of the stock market, beta of stock market, is 1. Now if you find a beta of company XYZ oops, and the beta is 2, what that means is on average, I've got to be really clear about this, on average any time the stock market moves, and that means either up or down, by, let's say, 1%, you probably see where I'm going with this, company XYZ's stock moves, well, twice as much, it's all relative, so by 2%. And that is the idea of beta. The idea of beta is that it tells you about the relative risk of investing in equity in this company relative to the overall stock market, or the market that we're, that we're analyzing. So if you come to think about it as you know, this relative risk measure, you can start thinking about how you'd apply it to you know, stocks that you know about. So if you're thinking about tech stocks, or very risky companies that haven't really shown earnings yet, but the market is kind of banking on the fact that one day they'll be able to monetize all their users or all their scientists that they have in R&D and kind of turn that into, you know, into real earnings and cash flow, um, then it's going to be very, very risky company. And a very risky company has a very high beta, which means that as the stock market is, you know, making fluctuations of, you know, one, a stock you know, with a beta of 5, we'll be making fluctuations like this, of this magnitude. Uh, you know, where the idea is that, you know, if this little area over here is moving up by 1%, then this area is moving up by 5%, you know. So, you know, this tells you a little bit about the risk of the company, and obviously, you know, if you take a, a company with a higher beta, you stand to win more, but you also stand to lose more. So, you know, a lot of portfolio managers like to weigh out their <laughs> portfolios to make sure that the beta, the overall weighted beta of the portfolio isn't too high, because if you just invest in a bunch of risky stocks, then the overall portfolio beta is going to be super, super high, and you'll have a very, very risky um, Portfolio, but you know you obviously want to take stocks which are which are a little safer. Um, you know that kind of follow general trends in the market to kind of hedge out or diversify away that kind of risk. Um, so, so let's scroll back up and have a look at the CAPM model again. Um, beta, as we've just described, you know will be a relative measure. Um, so it could be 1.1, 1.2, 2.5. Uh, 0 0.6, you know, anything down to 0, um, and, you know, that will be the variable that you plug in over here, and it will be given to you in the question. 
Um, now, RM minus RF is what we call the market risk premium. And the, mar the return on the market will be given to you in the questions such as, you know, the S&P 500 has returned 10.1% uh, historically. So there you go, he's telling you about the S&P 500, he's telling you about the return on the market. So, you know, look out for keywords such as S&P, um, or just stock market index, or stock market, or uh, you know, the Dow Jones, no one really cares about that anymore. Um, but, you know, just any of these words which tell you, uh, which send off triggers in your mind thinking, oh, well, he's talking about the market at large, he's telling you about the return on the market. Um, and the market risk premium, you know, you can just calculate because it's RM minus RF. Remember, he might not break out the return on the market for you, he might just tell you, well, the market risk premium is this. So he's basically told you this whole thing. Um, but you'll be looking to calculate the return on equity because that's the cost of equity and that's what we care about now in terms of the cost of capital. Um, so as you can see, again, just a quick interpretation before we move on um, to the WAC, and that is that the return on equity is equal to the risk-free rate because an investor um, expects to gain at least the risk-free rate um, you know, plus more because he's investing in the stock market, so he's getting at least the risk-free rate plus beta times the market risk premium. So the market risk premium is pretty similar for most stocks. It's, I mean, technically for this course, we can just say it's the same for all stocks because the return on the market is the same, the risk-free rate is the same, you know, at the time of analysis. But it's beta that really makes a big difference. If you're investing in a very risky company, that beta is going to be a lot higher, and that higher beta is being multiplied by this. So you can see that a riskier company is going to increase the return on equity, or the expected return on equity, f you know, that an investor that an investor expects um, from investing in the stock market. Alternatively, a much lower beta, um, you know, if you if you take a company which has a lower beta, it means you're taking less risk. So therefore, you know, you should expect less returns. So the CAPM really pulls a few nice basic financial concepts together, telling you about risk and return. If you take more risk, you know, as uh, as beta, you know, is increased. The return on equity is also increased because as you take more risk, you should expect, um, you know, a higher return for taking that risk. So it's uh, it's kind of relative to each other. Um, so that's the CAPM model, and it's going to come out to a percentage as well. So if we just scroll back up again, the CAPM model was really just a second way to calculate the cost of common stock. So if you're given these variables in a question, you know that he's asking you to use the CAPM model to calculate the cost of common stock. Alternatively, he might just give you dividend and price and flotation costs and growth rate in dividends. So there, you know, he'll be asking you to calculate the cost of common stock using this model. Um, but of course, you know, just look through the question and isolate, you know, what he's looking for. If you look through the question and you see that he's giving you beta and risk-free rate, you know that he's asking you to use the CAPM model to calculate the cost of common stock. Um, but just always go through and like I do, just, you know, find the find the variables, you know, f look for the keywords and say, oh, you know, he's mentioning, he's mentioning government bond or treasury bond, there's my RF. Um, he's mentioning a beta of 1.2, there's my beta. He's mentioning the S&P 500 has returned 10%, there's my RM. And then you'll have RM minus RF, and you'll be able to proceed and just bung those all in and come out with a nice percentage which will take us the cost of equity. So again, we're back to, back to the end of our kind of four-step process where we calculate the cost of debt, the cost of preferred stock, the cost of common stock, and the cost of retained earnings. And also there is something to note here that a company may decide not to use all types of, of capital raising. Um, it may decide just to use two of them, or it may decide just to use you know one of them. Um, but obviously a company is always looking to reduce its cost of capital, so it obviously looks for you know kind of a blend between uh, the four different types of raising capital so that you know, it can kind of get the best uh, a deal um, on raising its capital. So next time, we're going to tie everything up into the WAC, and then we'll move on to the final chapter for the final.